Well, hello everyone and welcome to Signature Style Saturday on whatever day you are seeing this. We decided to take a little break this weekend for the holiday and we enjoyed our time off. I hope you are enjoying your time off as well. Let's talk some signature touches today. As you know, if you followed me for any length of time, that one of my signature styles is evidenced through my use of line, shape, and form in the garden. And I am going to demonstrate a little bit of that, starting out with how I like to transform shrubs and limb them up into well, let's just say a shape that exposes the beautiful architecture of the branching. So we're gonna do a little bit of that and some other things related to that topic. Meanwhile, it is Xenia time. Oh my goodness. Once again, we have another week of 100 degrees coming up and it doesn't seem to bother the Xenias <laughs> nearly as much as it bothers us. And uh, uh, look at the monarchs, Stuart. The monarchs have just been unbelievable. I know we've showed them to you a lot, but in my world, you cannot show monarch butterflies too much. There's just, you cannot show them too much. What else is gonna go on? Oh, I'm gonna give you an update on some, a number of different observations you had about the backyard. I'm gonna show you my new uh, window treatment that will really give me a little bit more privacy inside, a few little luxuries, and of course, what I am reading and what I am watching and what I learned this week. So that's a lot to cover, Stuart, what do you say? Let's do it. Well, let's start out by talking about two beautiful natives, starting with this gray-leaved tea bush. I believe it's Malochia tomentosa or something like that. I obviously love it because I love the gray foliage and I love the kind of fuchsia colored flowers that it puts out, as do all of the bees and all of the pollinators. And again, it is a native. I am not sure. I've already cut it back once this year and I'm not sure sure how tall it will get, but I really like the way it looks. And I will like it better when I perform one of my signature touch demonstrations on this second beautiful native shrub that's growing in, in front of it. This is in the Rose of Sharon family. I don't know its exact name, but both of these came from Bustani Farms. Now, this is the first year I've had them <clears throat> escaping the bonds of their pot, and I actually put them in the ground. So obviously, they are achieving closer to what is their ultimate mature size, and I'm not really sure exactly what that is, but they're very happy in this location. This one, because it's so happy and it is blocking out this beautiful white rose behind it and to a certain extent the tea bush, I think I am probably going to relocate this somewhere. But as I was trying to determine if it would move, I noticed that it really has beautiful branching at the base and a really beautiful architecture to the branching. And it is getting so large that I thought, oh my gosh, I haven't limbed up anything in a while, a la like I did the viburnum at the other house, like I did my wajila, like I did uh, my all that glitters viburnum. And I decided that I just had itchy fingers and wanted to get my pruners out. And this looked like a candidate that I could do it on. So you guys know the drill if you have followed me for any length of time. And that's that I just kind of expose the interior branching by taking off some of the thinner limbs, in many cases, just a little bit less wide than a pencil. I take out anything that's dead and basically anything that looks kind of messy. Also, I take out anything that looks like it might be a sucker. In other words, it's growing straight <laughs> up instead of, instead of kind of flowing or arching. So all of these in here, I'm gonna take off. And I don't worry, you know, this is where you just be brave and have a little faith. I don't worry that I'm going to kill it because I know it's happy. I know because I have pruned it very slightly before that it can recover from pruning. And on the contrary, it actually likes pruning. So I'm not worrying about any of that because 
I know it's going to live. And if I make a bad cut, it, it's a bad haircut that will grow out. Okay, here's kind of a rule of thumb when I'm doing this. Any that are really low and branching like this one and thinner than the main branches, I typically take out. Why? Because one of the reasons I limb up things is because I want to be able to grow things underneath it, in the undercarriage of the plant, if you will. And so that is why I take out some of those that are growing low. Likewise, when I have a branch that I'm going to keep, like this one, I'm going to take off the low growing branches or the branches that grow down instead of up for the same reason, because it will make the plant look larger and it will also give room for things in and around it and growing underneath it to grow up through it and give me a little bit more textural interest. So that is what I am doing with this Rose of Sharon Cousin. Here's an example of taking off some of the undergrowth. And see how it gives so much more room and it allows the beauty of the plant surrounding it to shine through and it makes the garden look more structured. I think a little less untidy and another benefit of this is I love the way it creates really pretty shadows. So see in here, Stuart, from this vantage point, just how much less dense and cleaned out it looks. I love yeah, yeah, I think it's just, yeah, and this was up. not an expensive plant. And I love the little primrose looking flowers that it produces. It turns it kind of into art from where, not that it wasn't art before. Well, and it, it has more of a bonsai quality about there it, which I, yeah. which, which I like, a Japanese quality. But see how pretty that looks? And I will just continue with this. You guys don't have to stand out here <laughs> in this hot wind with me, but I will continue with this and then check back in the community tab and on the Wednesday walkabout, and I'll show you what it looks like when it's been complete and then I might get your help in deciding, I've got a couple of places in mind of where I might wanna relocate it, and I might get your input on that. Now, I wanna move over to another area where I'm gonna answer some of the questions that you had, but let's take one last look at how beautiful that, that uh, Rose of Sharon native looks. Let's take a break here, Stuart. Well, here's my question of the day. How many of you have bought one of these wonderful lightweight metal hoses? Some of you have mentioned that I never mention the brand. Well, the brand is Blue Bala because I know there are different ones available. B-L-U-E-B-A-L-A. -E I will put a link below. I've bought three of them, I think. And if you are someone who has bought one of them and have commented to me that you did too and how much you love it, then put a link below and make sure to share the link with other people because I mean, this is one of my best buys that I've gotten this year. I absolutely love it. So speaking of hoses and putting hoses away, I have meant to answer this question for a very long time and I have not. So I told you about the hack of getting a nursery bucket, making a recess, a dug in recess into the ground, putting the bucket into the ground almost at, at ground level so that you could then put your hose in it, okay? And this has been a brilliant solution for me. From the street, you can't even tell that this is here. So it's less of a from, right from here, you can't <laughs> even tell, really. It's black and it fades in. But what I failed to mention, and some of you were concerned, was doesn't it fill up with snakes, with mice, and more importantly, with water? And no, it doesn't, because that's the beauty of nurse using a nursery pot, because it has excellent drainage. And not only that, when it rains, it not only does not fill up with water, 
but all of the water drains right through there, goes into the surrounding soil to benefit any plants that are growing in the vicinity. Now, I don't get snakes because I don't have snakes in my garden. I live in an urban garden. I have seen maybe a couple of very tiny lizards and maybe tiny garden snakes. But that's about it. I just don't have that kind of wildlife here. Even though I live in Oklahoma, a lot of you have talked about, do I have snakes? And I do not. Um, and if I have a tiny little lizard, well, then that's all to the good because they eat bad bugs, I believe. And they're kind of cute. So <laughs> this answers that question that so many of you had. Will it not fill up with water? No, it will not. And I think it's just a great idea. So let's move on to another question you've had. Well, as I was putting up my hose one day, I came across something that was just very unexpected and very delightful. And that's my challenge for this week that we will be putting in my newsletter that comes out on Wednesday. If you are not subscribed, you want to do that because we do all sorts of fun things. We share all sorts of tips, tricks, uh, and little insights that you might want to be a part of. So if you haven't, go to lindavotter.com, sign up for our email because my challenge of the week is, is for us to go out into the garden or even in our homes and look for something that is just an unexpected surprise, happy surprise. This past week, I kind of have been a little bit down in the dumps because it's been so, so hot, just incredibly hot. And the hot is not going to go away. So that kind of get, puts me in a blue funk or a red hot funk, <laughs> I guess. But when I find little surprises like this, it inordinately cheers me up. And I want you to look for them too, and I want you to share. So as I was putting up my hose, I discovered that under here, I have, it must have been a cutting of some sort. I do not know how it got under here, but there's an angel wing begonia that's tucked in underneath this boxwood. And as soon as it gets cool enough, I'm gonna dig that baby up. I'm going to put it in a pot where it will reside on one of my theater terraces that I've got in the back that already has all sorts of pots of angel wing begonias. I'm also going to record that if I ever, as soon as I get it, I shouldn't say if I ever, I will get it. My garden journal comes out in November and I will record that in my garden journal. Just one of the little delights that we need to be looking for when it's very, very hot. Now here's another delight. And also this relates to signature touches and my obsession with different kinds of wine shape and form in the garden. Now I have showed you ad nauseum how much I love this boxwood basil. I have to say it's probably one of my most top three most favorite things that I planted this year. It's still going strong because I keep it pruned even though I've let one go to seed. So I have already started harvesting some of that seed and put it in my little seed packets and Leah we need to put a link to the seed packets but look over here I cut some I should say I pinched some off of it and you can see I don't know the seeds are so tiny I don't know if you can see them they're little tiny Probably. black seeds okay yeah. like that so I pinched some off as often happens I got interrupted or I started visiting with someone and I took a bunch of these seed heads and in the pot, that was a question of the day a while ago, do I keep the scaviola that was really suffering in here or do I pitch it? Well, I pitched it and on top, I just placed some of those seed heads, not really thinking about planting them, not really being intentional at all. I just put them on the surface to gather later. Well, look how many of them germinated. So as soon as I started seeing that they were germinating, and Stuart, can you see just how many, yeah, really how many there are? And we still have so much growing season left that I will be able to transplant these to other areas. And what I will then do, because this, this boxwood basil seed is so prized, 
and I think I recommended it. And now it's it, the source that I knew of is sold out. And by the way, if I recommend something, um, and I say this just as, as a public service announcement, I guess, if I recommend something, you might, and you think it might solve a problem you have you or uh, um, or something that you just want, then you might want to order it pretty quickly because <laughs> because uh, quite Great. unintentionally, some of this stuff has started to sell out. And so if you want it, you might want to go ahead and get it when we provide the link and the links are in the description box. I am not a sponsor of this boxwood basil seed. <laughs> But I do know that it is sold out where I, <laughs> where I, I was sourcing it from. So you might want to get some and grow, grow your own because I think it is just really, really a special thing. And because I adore its rounded, mounded shape, which is one of the signature touches of my garden. So let's move on to another signature touch. Well, now I can see who is at my door. In the past, all I had to do was look out my round window and I could see whoever was coming up my path, but they could also see me, maybe working in the kitchen or working in the background. And that really made me feel too exposed and as if I didn't have enough privacy. So you have probably followed along to see me debate what should be the optimal solution to this well, come on in, Stuart. Come in this side and let me give you the reveal of what it looks like from the other side. And right here, Stuart, is where we can put a little bit of the footage of Window Genie installing this beautiful film over my window. The film goes in the interior only. It doesn't go on the exterior. Why? probably because of exposure to the elements, but also because this is a beveled glass window, which has a flat surface in the back, but it does not have a flat surface. That's where the bevel is in the front. Now, not only does this give me privacy, but it also really hides all of the scratching that was on the glass itself. It has virtually disappeared. Some of you said that you just went to Home Depot and you got something and that worked for you. Well, I know that for me, if there was any imperfection in this, it would drive me crazy. And it took three visits and quite a bit of time for them to come out and be very exacting in applying the film. Not only did they clean the glass, did they then alcohol the glass, but they also around the perimeter made sure that there was no clumps and bumps of any paint overwash, that there really wasn't anything sandy that would keep me from having a completely flat surface. I think I discussed before how I decided on this pattern and it was because this is the exact pattern that is in the glass in the closet next to it. It's actually probably a little bit larger. This is a little bit smaller. It's a glass block look, but that's appropriate, I think, because this is a larger window. I love the way it looks. You could not in any way tell that it was not a glass treatment. I love, Leah noticed, I think, the way when light shines through it, it creates pretty rainbows, and it's just a brilliant solution, I think, to what had been a really vexing problem for me. And as much as I love the casement windows in the back, and I do, this one actually in my day-to-day -day rounds gives me a little bit more bang for my buck because it makes me feel as if I have a sense of privacy and more of a sense of enclosure and intimacy in the inside. Now let's go to another signature touch. Well, you all know that I read your comments. I take them to heart. Sometimes it's not something that I have thought of. Sometimes it is. Sometimes, um, well, let's just say that this was, of all the comments yesterday of the backyard reveal, this was the most helpful to me and one of my favorite observations and helpful tips that you guys have given me. And that is, 
and also probably one of the most controversial things that I exposed yesterday, and that is both the placement and the looks of my rain barrel. Now, let me first address the placement of it. Some of you thought that I really should have hidden it in a different corner, that it was just too up front and center, something of this kind of utilitarian and industrial magnitude shouldn't hold center stage like this. But to that, I would say, number one, I like the looks of a wood barrel. I think it's kind of rustic. I also can kind of envision what it will look like when the bottom will pretty much be completely obscured by surrounding plantings. You will barely be able to see it from the steps when you come down. I also know from my other one that I had at the other house, that this is a great platform for me to have some kind of seasonal color. And I just kind of like it's the rustic chic of it. Now, the best advice you guys gave me, because in my mind, I'd looked at it so much. You guys know how this is. You look at something so much that you don't see it anymore. Well, I had looked at this here so much and I just it was just kind of an afterthought that I didn't really intuit that the color of it, which is kind of a grayish brown, really is a different color from the Vodder Cottage Gray that I have on the fence and on my house trim. So I love the recommendation that some of you gave me that I paint this the same color as the fence and the raised beds. So thank oh you so much. Yes, it will be this color. So thank you so much for that. Now, another practical reason that it is here is because of the pitch and the slope of the roof and the guttering. So we had to do some gutter changes when we bought this house. And this was really the only place that it could reside. And given the summer that we have had, so far, it's a priority for me to have a rain barrel and a water catch system. And so for me, even if it did look ugly, I would probably still keep it here. And you know me, one of my signature touches is that I really like to hide my uglies. And so I will do my best to hide the parts that to me are not becoming, but I definitely think it's really going to be handy. I'm going to like it, and I just think it has kind of a rustic chic to it. Now, over planted by it is this giant oak leaf hydrangea that doesn't look giant now because it has been moved and it has been abused. But before too long, it will really flesh out. It already appreciates the fact that I've put it in the ground and is producing new growth. And then there will be more greenery around this that will kind of flow and cascade over the side. So thank you, thank you so much for giving me a heads up about painting this, and indeed, I will follow through. Now let's talk about another space, another feature in the garden that you guys suggested that I paint. Now I know a lot of you are gonna say, oh my gosh, do you really wear white in the garden? Well, I am in the garden and I am in white <laughs> because wearing lots of white in the summer is very much a signature personal style touch of mine. I don't care if I'm white in the garden and I get it dirty because that's what there are washers and new laundry rooms for. So indeed I do wear white in the garden and especially when it is loose and flowy and really keeps me cool on hot days like today. Okay, the other thing that many of you asked, and what, I, what was interesting to me, it was mostly men. Many of you asked, do I plan to paint this facade, this west side of the backyard? Does the fence belong to me? Does it not? It's a different kind of fence. Would I replace it with the style of fence that I have? Well, for many different reasons, primarily economic, no, I will not be replacing it. Uh, or will I build a secondary fence in front of it to match my own? That does not bother me. And by the way, this fence does belong to my neighbor. Now, could I put a wash on this side of the fence to make it match the surrounding fence so that I had a complete 
360 of that Vauder Cottage Gray? Yes, I could. And that might be something that I consider later, but it is something that a decision and labor that I am going to defer because it's not, it doesn't really bother me right now. I am not exactly sure how the plantings along here are going to be executed. And so until I really have closure in my mind about this space, I have some sense of it, but oops, I just lost an earring, Stuart. Until I have some sense of closure about what exactly will happen here, I'm just gonna defer that decision until later. It would, the future Linda, it would be relatively <laughs> easy to do, but it does not bother me right now. This area is predominantly in the shade, so it, it, it doesn't scream, I am a different color than the cottage, cotter, cottage gray. So I'm not worried about it too much. I also know that by the time the surround here is built and there are other plantings, that there will be a lot of beautiful things, not cluttered, a lot of beautiful things going on that will detract from the fact that it doesn't match. But I appreciate, I appreciate the comment. I also appreciate the fact that let me pick up my earring before I forget it. Um, I appreciate the fact that a number of you commented that the trees, the cedar trees were going to be stressed because we had to bury the drainage pipe. And yes, I took that into consideration and they will get some additional watering and TLC and extra love. There is always the danger when you do that kind of tree work that one of the trees might succumb. And I realized that, but if this one succumbed, I really wouldn't mind it too much. And these other ones I've kind of equivocated, I've gone on and off back and forth about whether or not to keep them. So even though it would make me, it would make me sad, it wouldn't kill me. And so that was a gardening risk I was willing to take. So that has been taken into consideration all of this will be gone. So for those of you, and believe me, I understand and agree with your concern that there's a lot going on and, it, and I run the risk of getting too much stuff and it looking cluttered. Part of that is because you're seeing it in its unfinished state and there's just a lot of, excuse my French, but just a lot of crap still around. Um, someone astutely pointed out I may have too many seating areas and it may be looking a little bit too much. Well, maybe I didn't point out the fact that number one, this area is going to be always in kind of a state of transition. This is more of a workspace area. So sometimes the, uh, the grill will be pulled out and there will be a platform it can be pulled out on. Someone suggested maybe I needed to have a bit of green grass back here so that potential grandkids could play. Well, trust me, grass will not grow in this space. I can tell you that. And that is a solution that I discovered at the other house. When you can't get something to grow, you use an alternative. And in this case, that alternative is going to be gravel and brick and pavers. And all of this, which looks very unfinished right now, I promise you have a little faith, it will kind of all come together. Even the furnishings that I point out are over here. These furnishings will not probably live here all of the time, but they will be at the ready. And I, by the way, I love this furniture. Um, it will be at the ready to pull out when somebody, when my boys are taking grilling lessons from hubs or something, and they wanna sit here and talk to him while he's working on the grill, or somebody just wants to sit over here in the shade or get away from the other area. It will also be good because if I do something like entertain, Lee and I are gonna have a big dinner party out here. If I entertain, if I indeed am fortunate enough to have Thanksgiving out here, there will be another tabletop over here. And so I want this area to be pressed into service for that use. So it will be a very, very functional area, not necessarily a third seating area. Does that make sense, you two? Does that make sense? So uh, just have a little faith in me that this, this will be resolved. Um, we ha I had, 
I think more than ever, more comments from men than ever before, which was really fascinating to me. Someone asked about, okay, now this is the, the log rack is over here and it's not on top of the bench that I told you that I got for the east side of the back porch. Well, the reason it's here is just to kind of get it out of the way when the guys were installing the windows. A number of you also made the comment, okay, why didn't you have the focal point of the beautiful rounded steps on this side instead of on this side. Well, again, it's, it's good form meets good function. I wanted more of the pretty side to be on the side that will actually be traveling more, and that is this side. This is the way we primarily will be coming in and out. The other reason is I want access because we've got a wood burning, burning fireplace right indoors. I want easy, unobstructed access to the wood pile, which will be right here. So if I am coming out the door, I can come out the door like this. I can leave it open. I can get my wood. I can go like this and I can shut the door with my elbow. If I had it on this side, it's a completely different story. So that is why it's on this side. The other design reason is because I want this to ultimately be something of a garden room. And that garden room, albeit looks very, uh, looks very overdressed and cluttered now, will actually be absolutely wonderful and stylish once it is done. And there's a Japanese maple here and the windows are open and I've got my pretty wood pile. Now, one change I am making is indeed, I will have a wood rack on top of this, but I am probably gonna get a different one. Most of them are about that same depth. I'm probably going to get one that is heavier, a more substantial wrought iron than just painted aluminum like that one, so that it looks more attractive, it is sturdier and a little bit more functional. And then some of you commented, well, maybe I don't wanna have my pots here. Well, I love the look of terracotta, so I think they are inherently attractive. But if I discover that after living here for a while and going through a whole growing season, that maybe I want the pots, the terracotta to be over there, that they're not handy here, then indeed they might move. But I like the way this looks right here. I think Hubs likes the way this looks right here. <laughs> and <laughs> he's thinking, oh my goodness, I almost exposed myself. Um, I, I like the way it looks. The table here is being built. You had a lot of questions about that. It will be a long wooden groaning board table that will be rather rustic looking. A lot of you expressed concern that when these windows are open that we might hit our head. Well, we would almost intentionally <laughs> have to get up there and clank our head against the windows to hit our heads when the windows was, were open because the table will come out this way and those windows don't project that far into the backyard. So that will not be an issue. Also, there's quite a bit of clearance from the windows down to the ground. So that was a, um, another thing some of you had some concern about that maybe isn't evident from, um, from some of the photographs that we were going to show. Okay, Stuart, let's take a break here before we move on to another signature test. Well, we are back. My earring is back in place. And now I'm going to share with you one of the most exciting hacks that I discovered for myself just this morning. You guys know, again, this is about a signature touch, line, shape, and form. And I am obsessed with now not only rounded forms in the garden, but like squished gumdrop mounded forms that are flat on the bottom and then the mound just comes up and, and kind of erupts out of the ground. So I'm infatuated with that shape right now. 
as evidenced by the look and the profile of these hanging baskets that I've got positioned here upside down. Now this is about the effect, they'll be a little bit bigger, but about the effect that I want to simulate, it is similar to the effect in the picture that has been my muse, and we'll try to put that picture right here, because it's not really a rounded form as much as it is a mounded form. And to get this perfect mounded form, what I will do is plant whatever it is, put this as a profile and kind of a template over it, then when I clip it, I will clip it to the mounded form and that will give me at least originally this shape that I am going for. And I can use this with a variety of different kinds of plants, evergreens, um, sedums, all sorts of different plants, and I will have a similar village of rounded, mounded forms. And this is, these are going to be the templates that help me get started in between these mounded, rounded, probably evergreen forms, I had these negative spaces where I can maybe have just a few flowering things that come up and out and will be largely seasonal. So these will be, these are kind of right now just stand-ins. They're the stunt people for my mounded village forms that will be right here. And when I was walking down that concrete path and I saw them, I thought, that's exactly the form I want. I then thought, aha, why can't I use these as a template for some of the things that I'm going to grow here? Some of you have asked, well, in this area where I, it's not going to be planted, am I not worried about weeds? I have had very few weeds that have come up. Those that have come up are mostly little tree volunteers that come, I mean, they pull out so effortlessly. And I would rather, I would rather have a few weeds that are effortless to pull come up and out of this, which by the way, these spaces will not be irrigated and it's pretty much hard pan clay underneath this mulch. I would much rather, I guess, pluck the infrequent weed than I would putting down black landscape fabric that's plastic that I don't like, that I would constantly be in a war with to make sure that it stays in place, that it's not exposed, that it's trimmed, that the mulch hasn't sloughed off of it. So there is no weed barrier underneath this mulch. A few errant weeds might pop up and more power to them because I've got a solution for that, typically with my cup of coffee in hand on my morning stroll. I think that's about it for outside right now. I'm sure I'll have more things to share with you a little bit later, but now let's go inside for what I've learned this week, a few life luxuries and also some book recommendations. Well, let's jump right into it. What I am reading this week, though I have to say, I'm not doing a lot of deep reading this past week because there is just so much going on. Um, but two books that, let me put it this way, are on my radar. I love this book, Nature's Best Hope. I've actually talked about it before. It is, um, it, it's a work that I have not read from beginning to end. It's one of those that I read it, I get some inspiration and I close it and then I read another, another couple paragraphs or something, um, not reading it from cover to cover. But I love this and in fact, I think I even have a couple of quotes from it in my own book. And if you haven't gotten my book, you need to get it. Let's put an ad right here, Stuart. The Elegant and Edible Garden. But this is a brilliant, brilliant work. Um, it was a New York Times bestseller and I highly recommend it. It's an important work that I think really should be required reading, I think, in some of our schools because it's not just humans that depend on nature. Um, it is obviously all of our 
all of our other critters. This book is one that I have had for years. It's kind of a classic. I have always been a big Bunny Williams fan. Um, she is one of the iconic interior and garden decorators, designers that have been around for a while. And her book is equally as iconic, An Affair with a House. So periodically, it's one of those books that I keep open on my book stand and I just kind of use it to to get inspiration for really, really beautiful still lifes and styling both inside and out. I will say that now, as much as I still love her work, it looks way too layered for me. And I like a layered look. And I had um, a considerable amount of layering at the, at the fairy tale house, but now I'm wanting something that is a little bit cleaner, a little easier to maintain, and a little bit less visually, uh, visually distressing, I think. I just want a little bit more calm in my interior spaces. Nevertheless, if you took some of her still lifes and just did a redux, well, this would be a good example, just did a redux of one of her still life images or one of the places that she's got styled and just reduced some of the, some of the different components of it by about 50%, I think you would get exactly what you were looking for. If you do not have this book, I promise you, if you're like me, and most of you are, you will love the styling in this book. So I highly, highly recommend it. It's a great coffee table book, but as you guys know, I actually read and refer to all of my coffee table books. They're not just there for show. Um, so that is what I am reading this week. Okay, what I have learned this week, because I thought back to about a year ago, and I was telling Hubs, I said, do you realize that a year ago this week, we were in our pods on Finnair Lines flying to Singapore for my son Johnny's wedding. And we were there for two glorious weeks. It was absolutely wonderful. We had a great time, but boy, I guess what I've learned this week is reflecting on the year past both the good of it, the bad of it, the surprising of it, and how life never unfolds in a way you would expect. So it is not only the one year anniversary of his wedding, uh, Stuart, it's also almost the one year anniversary of you meeting me in the emergency room. Oh. Do you realize um, that? No. Yes, meeting me in the emergency room as soon as I got back, for those of you that know, know what I'm talking about, as <laughs> soon as I got back from Video Singapore, I <laughs> my doctor immediately sent me to the emergency room for uh, a bowel resection surgery. Stuart was there in the waiting room with me. Um, it's the only time in my life I had to go to the emergency room, not once, but twice in one week. It was kind of scary. Oh, I, uh, I did have major surgery. I was in the hospital for about 10 days. I had, looking back, such great friends, such great care. And and along those lines, this is what I mean. We just never know how life is going to unfold and we really need to appreciate it in the moment. I could not brag enough on my general surgeon who performed the surgery. He was absolutely brilliant. Um, and just recently, this past spring, he was killed um, in a fire when his home was struck by lightning and he went in to save, I think, I believe it was some of his family pets. His family got out and sadly he did not. So that was a shock to me. I think about it every time I look down at the scar on my tummy. I think about how life is so short, uh, but how people, no matter the length of their life, make such important contributions because he's left not only a big hole in his family's life, but in the medical community here in Oklahoma City. So I was reflecting back on that. I was reflecting back on the fact that, oh my gosh, I had no expectations that I was going to sell the fairy tale house, that I was going to discover the, the storybook cottage. I had no idea that I would start a new garden. I so many unexpected things that have been stressful, I know, that have been such great joys. I didn't know Leah was gonna come into our life. Um, 
there's just so many different unexpected things that have happened over the course of time, both good and bad, but mostly good. And so I've just been reflecting back on the past year. I've been looking at, and here's, a, here's kind of a hack. Um, I am starting to go through month by month. At the beginning of the month, I am going back into my iPhotos and I am looking at all the 2,000 to 3,000 images I have for that month, that September, uh, in this case, for September. And I'm going back and I'm deleting a lot of them. I'm being re-inspired by some images I had forgotten about some of my own creations, some of others' creations, um, notes that I took and just documented and put it in a notes folder that I'd forgotten about. And so there's a hack. Take the time as you reflect on the year past, go back through your photos and see if they aren't inspiring, informative, and insightful. Okay, Stuart, let's go on to the next segment. Okay, I am so excited about this, you all. This is one of the little life luxuries I am treating myself to. And one version of this is actually on sale for a Labor Day special on Light right now. And we will definitely put a link. And if you want it, you want, might want to hop on the link right away. And this actually, who knew? Hubs, I discovered this from Hubs. He had this new toy he was playing with. And I asked him, I said, what is that? And he said, well, this is my new tiny little ivy printer and it is it works via connecting uh or via bluetooth from your iphone or your i guess your android and you can select a picture from your phone and you can then print it out instantaneously with these little adhesive uh I guess, what's this called? Photo paper, adhesive photo paper that almost looks like little thumbnails. And I think I mentioned to you before that Hubs likes to go on adventures. This most recent adventure, he took images of lots of pic yeah, pictographs and pic petroglyphs. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly. Um, different little friends he met along the way. And he also likes to document document his travels in a beautiful leather bound journal. And then he just removes the adhesive from these tiny pictures and he puts them then on that date in his journal. I've got the journal upside down, but he can then document where he was, what he was thinking about, what his, uh, and just remember different experiences in different places that he might otherwise forget without having to go through all of, of the regular size photos that we sometimes go through. This way, it just puts it in context, in place, and in this case, in his leather, Yellowstone leather-bound journal that he got when he, was in, when he was in Yellowstone. Now I thought, okay, I am so going to copy this idea. When I get my garden journal, and by the way, you guys, it will come out in November. It will have, it's a five-year journal. It will have more than enough entry space for you all to take images, print them out, and then stick them in your garden journal. So then when I see a tulip blend that I love or a planting combo that I absolutely love or a plant on a garden tour or a garden ornament, anything like that, I can take an image of it, even if it's in my own garden, and I can then remove the adhesive and put it on the appropriate page. This is just a blank version because it doesn't come out until November, <laughs> though this is the real outdoor outside cover of it that you notice is, let me plug my book, that is a companion piece to the elegant and edible garden. Best friends. Best friends. And yes, this will <laughs> be kept right here on my front table so that whenever I make an observation, when I notice the first monarch butterfly, um, when the zinnias are at their peak, whatever is going on, I can document that in my garden journal. And now I have an image to go along with it, a coordinating image. And I think it's so much fun. Um, this one, I want to say, Leah, did I tell you this one was $149, I think, which is not a bad price. But now you can get it, I think, in pink, which is kind of fun, 
for around $100. We will put the link. This is a Labor Day special, I think, though actually um, Hub's got his when it wasn't on sale. So like I say, I decide I want something. And So there you go. I am rambling, but it's partly because I'm so excited about this little tiny printer. I'm going to show you a couple of other life luxuries, little life luxuries that are both functional, but will also, I think, on a daily basis, enhance the quality and the beauty of your life. Well, here are a couple of beautiful little life luxuries. And I think I showed you last week how if, if something is functional and I want to be able to leave it out, then I want it to be beautiful. And so I traded in my plastic measuring cups and measuring spoons for some that were in a brushed gold and wood. And when I was in Alexandria, Virginia, not too long ago, I saw these wonderful marble bowls. I love them. I love the fact that they repeat the marble pattern on my island and they were just beautiful and they were also kind of a, a souvenir, a traveling keepsake that I bought from a store in Alexandria. So I got a large one for my salt <clears throat> and a smaller one for the pepper and I keep this very close to my stove because I think they are beautiful and functional. So when I saw a butter keeper that was also marble that I can leave out on the counter. That keeps my butter soft. And since the last porcelain one I had, which I also loved, um, it broke. It was dropped um, on the floor. It broke. So I thought, well, if I'm going to replace it, that I am going to replace it with something that is just a little life luxury. And in this case, it's marble. And it also really repeats and coordinates with the little marble bowls that I got in Alexandria. Now, there's something, we found something similar. We will put a link to them below because they just are inherently beautiful and they just give me a little jolt of pleasure when I look at them. Likewise, I, I, you guys may know, I've shared before that I have a little bit of a, a fetish for pictures. I love beautiful pictures, interesting pictures. I also have kind of a fetish for trays. I find them eminently practical. I use them all of the time in all sorts of different forms. I bought a beautiful one a while ago. I think a lot of you guys bought it too that I bought off of Amazon. It was a gorgeous uh, patterned enamel tray with this brassy gold trim, which repeats a lot of the brass notes that I have in my living room and in my kitchen. So when I saw this square one, in this beautiful, what I am calling September blue, because this is going to be our color of the month, this September blue and brass. I loved it when I saw it and I start, had started entertaining more on the social patio. We were here for a meeting. I was bringing everyone their iced tea and I used this tray and I just loved it. It was not expensive. It would make a great gift. I'm actually going to get one for my kiddos. A lot of these things I get for myself and if I really like them, then I think, okay, this is going to make Christmas shopping easier. I can get one for them as well. So of course, I will put the link below. This comes in in so many different fun colors. I can't tell you. I have a similar version in a Kelly green that I just love, but it is just a jolt of color and a jolt of happiness and a luxurious little grace note for your kitchen or your living room. Well, as an end note, I, I'm going to apologize <laughs> because um, I feel like I'm Costco or Walmart that has uh, way too early has their Christmas decorations out. But I'm only doing this because I'm really planning ahead far in advance of what I normally do for the holidays. Because number one, I'm going to be on the neighborhood Christmas home tour. And number two, it is the weekend my son Johnny gets home for Christmas um, for for Christmas vacation, gets home from Singapore, and then my daughter-in-law will come shortly after that. So I don't want to be spending all of my time stressing about my decor and everything. I want to already have it in place and up and ready for the home tour and, of course, for him when he comes home for the holidays. So forgive me that um, I'm really jumping the gun on Christmas, but I did want to share a couple of things with you. So I told you about my mood board 
my muse board that I've got up here for the holidays because this is my first, this will be my first Christmas season in the cottage. And I have been kind of looking at different Christmas trees, different, just different ideas that I might want to execute and might give me um, a little bit of inspiration in more blue tones, a little bit of inspiration for the holidays. Look at that beautiful table setting up there. So I thought, well, what direction do I want to go in? Do I, do I want to go all natural? Do I want to go a little bit more sparkly? Sure people are actually pretty interested in what you have on your board. So I'm going to show them what oh, you have okay, on what board. I have my board. Now my board is messy. I'm not going on that side. Stay okay. on the Christmas side. Okay, stay on the Christmas side. <laughs> uh, and and th this, is a, this is a fun thing. This is my list of things that when I moved into the neighborhood that my bestie made for us. These are all things that we're going to do That's together. So I need to cross some of them off because we've already done with them. So anyhow, this is what's this is what's on my okay, mood board. I'm done, okay, now, and I'm not going to show you the rest of my office because it is in a state of terrible dis disrepair. <laughs> uh, I'm tackling it this week now that the backyard, I don't have to be outside in the backyard so much. Okay, so I saw this Christmas tree online. I am not really much of an artificial Christmas tree kind of gal until these sparkly Christmas trees that look a little, and, it's, and definitely it is trendy, but that look a little bit more like topiary. And so because of that, they appealed to me and I equivocated over whether or not I wanted to go the silver route or I wanted to go, uh, I wanted to go the white route or what I wanted to do, even the blue route. And I decided to go in this metallic, metallic look that sometimes reads silver and sometimes reads brass depending on how the light falls on it. Uh, but I like the fact that it's got a little bit of, of the brass tonal range because again, that's kind of a grace note in my home. So this is going to go in the front parlor. It will probably be elevated somehow. And pretty soon there will be a thrifting adventure and a thrifting video, Stuart, as I begin to look for things that I find will be eminently appropriate for this kind of, of aesthetic for the parlor. So it's kind of fun, but I wanted to show it to you. Um, I will put a link below. There will be a living full green fragrant Christmas tree that will be outside and of course greenery inside. But this is one I will have for years. When I get some kind of piece of, of Christmas decor, I have it for years. So I gave myself permission to get this one. I still have lots of the fronds that need to be separated and puffed out. But I love it. I already am envisioning sugar plums and different kinds of, of fun things in my holiday future. And I hope that you guys, um, maybe it may not be seasonally appropriate, but we will just kind of be humming some Christmas tunes as we close out this signature style Saturday. Thank you guys for hanging in with me. Please remember everyone in Hawaii and Florida along the Southeast Atlantic coast, anyone who is, who is just suffering some heartache right now. Thank you. You guys have a great week.